How are y'all doing? It's Joe Doyle, comic book artist, Symbio fan. You are now watching the Venom Vlog. Hey, welcome Parasites to another episode of the Venom Vlog. And today, it's another year, so it's another time for another Lethal Protector book. Uh, this is the third book called Lethal Protector. Since I started this show, uh, back before I started this show, there was only one book called Lethal Protector that came out in the 90s. But then Mike Costa did a, a run during his run on Venom. He did a little story arc called Lethal Protector Blood in the Water. And then we had no other Lethal Protector stories for a while until Marvel decided they wanted to do these flashback stories. They started with Symbiote Spider-Man and those were a big hit. And they started doing them with other characters. And now they worked their way to Venom and they got David Michelini to come back to write this series. And he wrote the last Lethal Protector, which for some reason they just called Lethal Protector. And then they're calling this Lethal Protector 2. But I'm like, well, this is Lethal Protector 4, technically. And the last one was 3. So now they have like colon something. So it's like Lethal Protector colons, you know, in a subtitle. Um, so that's great that they're doing that. It'll make it easier in trade paperback form. But they're still a little all over the place with the continuity because <laughs> the first Lethal Protector takes place when it does in the 90s. And then I believe this one and the previous one take place right before it or, or maybe even right after it. It's really hard to say, but it's kind of in that ballpark, in that realm of the first Lethal Protector within like a year or two probably of the events of that book. Um, but it's still Venom in New York, so I'm guessing it's before he makes a deal with Spider-Man and before he goes to San Francisco. So that's kind of where we are. And then the Mike Costa Lethal Protector <laughs> takes place, you know, a more current day, right before Donnie Cates' run. So it's a little all over the place, uh, you know, but that's okay. You know, that's what makes comic books so fun is trying to piece all this stuff together. Now, there is one thing in the last Lethal Protector. I criticized David Michelini for kind of being all over the uh, you know place with his continuity. Like, does it take place here during this point? Does it take place here? Is it during the Spider-Man annuals or, you know, the Vault storyline or right after the Vault? Um, is it during the time where he crossed over with, like, Darkhawk and, uh, you know, an Iron Man or something? Is it in that ballpark or is it later? Is it closer to Lethal Protector? Is it after Maximum Carnage? Uh, you know, they don't mention Carnage in these, so maybe it's not, car you know, during that time. Not that it's that important, but there were times in the last book where it, it felt like, oh, it's taking place during this time. And then they would say something that you're like, oh, okay, well, okay, maybe then it's taking place after this then? And then it kind of just made me lose interest. You know, I kept pulling out of the story. And then the story itself, although an interesting concept kind of, I didn't feel like there was a real goal other than, okay, we have this villain, he's kind of monitoring Venom, and he wants the symbiote, and okay, and then he's going to hire a bunch of goons to try to take Venom down. It was, like, very basic. And although I'm not against basic, I think basic can be fun and, you know, kind of fun, mindless adventure stuff, and Venom is ripe for that kind of storytelling, but I just didn't think that last one was a good execution of that type of story. This one, I will give it credit. This feels like it's more of a, a real concept. Like, okay, I want to take Venom and do like a spy story with him or something, um, or have him work with an espionage group like Silver Sable's you know, company. This is more of a story that involves her and Nick Fury and spy stuff and you know, probably going into Latveria because Dr. Doom's involved. You're gonna see some of that in here too. So this just feels like more of a, an actual story. Like, okay, it's not just a random villain you know, with a bunch of goons he's hiring and, you know, and it's just like a villain of the day going after Venom or something like that. Like this feels like it's trying to tell a story. Um, so I will give the book credit for that. And that's why I'm gonna be more positive this time around because I feel like maybe some of that criticism, even though if, if you know, not that anyone should listen to me per se, it's just like, I'm just sharing my criticism, but hopefully someone heard it. And it feels like someone heard similar criticism because this feels like a more focused book. Like it, it shows you, pretty early on that it takes place during the, you know, the time leading up to Lethal Protector, the first one. So it's like, okay, that's cool. And it says it takes place just a few weeks after the last book. So it's like, great. Now I know where I am roughly in the continuity. I can now just try to enjoy this book. And it even brings characters back that we met in those Spider-Man annuals, like Pablo, who shows back up in this book, which was a kid who Venom, you know, helped save in a way. He got revenge for Pablo because Pablo's dad was murdered and Venom jumped in and helped out and got involved. And then so Pablo tells his origin in this, like what happened after that event? How did he get to be working with an evil organization called Vanguard in this? So let's streamline this. Now that I've kind of just rambled, uh, you know, for the intro here, let's kind of focus in. What is this book about? This book is about Eddie trying to lay low and find a place to sleep uh, because New York, it's wintertime, it's getting cold. Uh, and he's just like, yeah, I don't want to be sleeping above ground. I'm starting to be recognized more. More people know my face now as Eddie Brock and as Venom. 
So even just going to buy a hot dog is hard for Eddie because people start recognizing him. So he's living in the sewers and on like a, a crappy mattress and he's dumpster diving for food. And so he's not in a good place. Um, so, but he's still trying, right? He still grabs flowers. He wants to go see Anne Wang. And uh, when he goes and visits her, there's some random kid there who's subletting her apartment. So she's off doing something. Um, at this point, who knows, maybe this is the point where she's pregnant with Dylan or is bringing Dylan, you know, to Eddie's father in San Francisco. She's out of town. So it could be that point in her continuity there. Um, but I do feel a little irked because I thought doing these flashback stories would give us more of Anne. And although she appeared a couple times in The Last Lethal Protector, this one, it looks like she's going to be absent for most of it, so or some of it at least. And it's like, well, what's what's the point of going back and telling stories during this time and fleshing out Anne more as a character if you're not actually going to do that? Uh, so that irks me just a little bit, but it's a minor nitpick because, like I said, I feel like this is a little bit more focused, although everything just seems to happen to Venom in this. Uh, coincidentally, it's like he's, you know, oh, I'm looking for a place to live, and he goes into the sewers uh, or into a subway, and then Vanguard soldiers are there, and he gets involved with them. And then from there, he meets Silver Sable and uh, and then gets caught up in her storyline. And then from there, meets Pablo, and then so on and so forth. So everything just kind of falls into his lap. He doesn't really actively do anything, although there's a line that tries to suggest he does, where at the beginning, he goes into the subway, he fights two Vanguard guys, and he's kind of like, yeah, let's, you know, the symbiote's like, let's go, let's just leave. And Eddie's like, no, you know what? I was a journalist and before I met you, symbiote, and now let's go and uh, I want to investigate this. I'm a little curious, and that's what leads him. So he kind of propels his story a little bit, but in kind of a lazy way, too, at the same time. Um, but it, it's fine. Uh, these are all minor nitpicks and things that I'm just mentioning as, like, stuff that stuck out to me. But overall, I kind of had fun with this book. Uh, there is a villain that is building up in this book, uh, two villains, one of them being Dr. Doom, who for some reason has an interest in Eddie Brock, and he hires the Vulture to go steal some information about Eddie Brock. So there's that. And again, I mentioned that that could set up that Venom Bomb storyline that we never, we kind of briefly talked about on the show. So maybe I'll make a full episode on it, where in Bendis' Avengers run, he had Dr. Doom take a sample of the symbiote and create a Venom Bomb. You know, <laughs> even though that technically was set up in the Ultimate Universe, but somehow paid off in the main universe. I don't want to get into all that again, but this could be the story that's trying to uh, pinpoint that continuity there and how Doctor Doom was able to make that Venom Bomb years later. So who knows? Uh, but the artwork is very great. Fareed, who does the artwork, it does an awesome job. I actually thought this book looked really good. The, the, it's exciting. The, pa the panel layouts are really nice. Um, and then even in scenes where like Nick Fury is giving an exposition dump on, on Silver Sable. What's cool is that the artist still is drawing stuff happening, you know, so it's not just Silver Sable and Nick Fury talking to each other. They're, they're doing flashback and, and showing these this uh, organization called Majestic 12. It was a top secret uh, thing that was happening that was investigating alien technology, you know, when it first started arriving on Earth. And so they're setting kind of that up. Although I don't know how that ties into... The Weapon X and Weapon V and all that stuff that Donny Kate set up. But at least here, you know, Nick Fury knew about this and uh, and this has been going on for years. So it is an exposition dump, but they do it really quickly. You get it over with in like a page and a half and it goes right back to Silver Sable and her team who they just lost a member during this, uh, during this big kerfuffle at the beginning where Venom randomly steps into this battle where it's Silver Sable and her group fighting the Vanguard. And they're trying to get something, protect something that uh, the Vanguard wants to steal. And Nick Fury hired Silver Sable to protect it because I guess he couldn't get enough agents there in time. But he had enough time to contact her and set up this for her to protect us. So <laughs> who knows? It's it's all good. It's a little minor nitpicks, but it's fine. The story's fine. There's a little bit of heart to it. Pablo's story when he talks about what happened to him after his dad's murderer was brought to justice or killed by Venom brought to justice. Uh, after that happened, he talks about, you know, he went and lived with the nuns and then New York scrapped that building, you know, to make way for new apartments. And then he got put back on the street. And then from there got, uh, you know, because he was, um, you know, kind of a vulnerable young man, the Vanguard scooped him up and, and kind of brainwashed him and brought him in this organization. It kind of makes me feel a little bit like uh, Finn from Star Wars, that he was like a young man who got pulled in by the Empire and then decides on his one of his first missions, this is not what I want to do. That's kind of what Pablo is here. 
and he kind of wants to be Eddie Brock's sidekick. So he's like, hey, you know, and Eddie's like, I don't need a kid Venom. And and Pablo's like, oh, that's okay. I'll, I'll still help out. And he does a couple times in the book. And this is a, a hefty book, by the way. Um, this is a, run, runs for $4.99. And this is the Alex Ross cover, by the way. I had to have this cover because um, Alex Ross drawing Venom is just amazing. But um, this book is hefty. I mean, there's a lot of page count to this. Uh, it, it feels like a, a comic and a half. And there's, yeah, it's, like I said, I found myself having fun reading it. I don't love this book, um, but it definitely doesn't fall into some of the things, the criticisms I had with the last book. Like I said, this feels a little bit more focused, a little bit more streamlined, and it feels like Michelini is trying to get somewhere with these characters. And I like that, because in the last book, it was just kind of too mindless of fun and not enough real focus. Uh, and also, I don't know why he doesn't do this. Uh, he kind of did this back when he wrote Venom the first time too, but he doesn't really have the symbiote talk a lot. Uh, hardly ever. I mean, you have Eddie respond to the symbiote, but we, the audience, don't see them talking. Um, now, there's uh, many reasons you could do this. Maybe it's just his style. He doesn't want to overpopulate the you know page with uh, dialogue balloons, which I'm totally down for that. I you know this is great artwork. I wouldn't want to cover up a lot of this stuff either. But I still feel like you know I I like the banter sometimes between you know Eddie and the symbiote. So maybe that's something he'll develop as he's writing this and as we get deeper into the story is we'll start seeing that more and more. Maybe or maybe he won't. You know, it's just a personal preference. Mine is I like seeing what the symbiote's saying because I like the you know the odd couple banter. The movies I think captured that really well. But here I'm like, ah, I kind of miss that. So when Eddie says lines like, yeah, it's nice having Pablo around because it's like having someone to talk to and the symbiote you know, makes a noise and he's like, nah, he's like, yeah, I like talking to you too. But it's like, we don't see you guys talk <laughs> really. So it's, it feels like a weird thing to throw into that conversation in my opinion. Um, it's like, well, if, it, it'd be one thing if Eddie's every page had dialogue balloons from the symbiote where it's like, it recently learned how to communicate with them externally and it's talking to them not incessantly. And they're just like, gah, 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 gah. and Eddie's just like, God, I just want some peace and quiet. And then he sees Pablo and then Pablo, you know, he's like, oh, wow, another voice. Like, this feels nice talking to someone and having a conversation with someone other than the symbiote. And then that could give the symbiote a reason to not want, you know, uh, Pablo around or something. So I don't know. There's just other things you could have done to kind of illustrate that um, if you really wanted to. But, uh, you know, Michelini went this route. And although I'm not a fan of it, it didn't really hurt overall my enjoyment of the book. Um, it's just another nitpick thing. And, I, and that's all I can really say about this because I thought this was a little bit stronger than the last run. So yeah, like I said, you have some evil villains that are working for the Vanguard, and, and they have all these names like Agent Major and Agent Colonel and all this stuff. Um, and then you have, and they have these unit troopers that they send out that, you know, Eddie makes short work of. But then, like I said, you also have Dr. Doom out there hiring the Vulture to get information on Eddie. So yeah, and I hope we see a Vulture Venom fight. That would actually be really cool in this book. Um, but then at the end, that's when we get the real crux of the story, which is it's kind of be, you know, kind of a buddy cop thing in a way where Silver Sable, she lost a man during the battle at the opening of the book and Nick Fury wants to continue to hire her to protect this item. And so she's like, well, I'm down a man. Venom came in. He doesn't really seem to like me because this is after their you know meeting in the comic books where they met in the pages of Silver Sable. So they already, he already knows her and he doesn't like her and he doesn't think she's an innocent. But she's like, look, come work for me. I'm down a guy. He died in the last battle uh, that you jumped in on. He goes, but we would have lost more men if you weren't here and we need to protect this thing. And those guys weren't ready for you and they're scared of you. That gives us an edge. So I'm going to hire you. I'll pay you to work for Silver Sable International and together we'll protect this item for Nick Fury. So that seems neat, you know, uh, and, and that for me is like, okay, there's a real concept here. It's not random. You know, this is a real story being told and whether I like every you know beat of that story or not is kind of irrelevant because I do like the overall concept this time around of this book so I'm on board I gotta say I'm, I'm being a more positive on this one this one actually surprised me in a good way um, so those are my thoughts I would say overall this book is probably a maybe a three to a three and a half out of five so somewhere in that ballpark you know uh, but definitely not higher than a three and a half but I would say because the artwork was really good and I had a lot of fun just turning the pages and looking at the artwork too, I'd probably lean close to a three and a half out of five. Uh, but that's my review of this. Do you have a different review? You know, do you rate it higher, lower, whatever it is, if you have different nitpicks or real criticisms, whatever you have of the book, let me know down below. And as always, we'll keep talking down there. 
Um, thank you guys so much for watching the show. I'm, I'm sorry I'm behind on stuff. Probably at this point, I've been having headaches. I'm even re-recording this because the last time I recorded it, I was actually very low energy. My head was hurting too bad and I kind of toughed through it. And when I rewatched the footage, I was like, I'm not putting this on YouTube. This is, this is, I don't want people to see me this way. I, I, I want people to see me energetic and having fun because that's what this show is. It's, it's my escape. So I'm glad I got to re-record this for you guys with my new background and everything. So yeah, thank you so much for watching the show and being patient with me. I'll have more videos soon, but I will be taking probably a week off coming up soon because I have some writing to do, uh, uh, editing and writing on Neverland. So I can start getting those updates going for the next book on Kickstarter. So I have stuff I got to work on writing wise for a while. Um, so I'll be slowing down on some videos here, but we're also probably going to start getting movie news soon for Venom 3. So I'm going to try to catch up on some comic book stuff in my spare time so that we're hopefully fully caught up on everything going into the summer of symbiotes. I want to get caught up on everything by the end of April if I can. Carnage, Savage Avengers, you know, everything that's currently out there right now. Um, you know, Miles, Car you know, everything. I want to catch up on everything so we're ready for summer of symbiotes. So yes, and don't forget, I do have a, kind of a fun thing we're doing for episode 800. If you have a concept for a alternate universe Venom for the Venomverse, and you want to email it to me, that's my email right there, the parasite podcast at gmail.com. If you email your idea, just keep it to one or two paragraphs, um, you know, and like maybe five or six lines in each paragraph. Send that to me um, through there. Don't leave it in a comment. Don't post it like where other people can read it and see your idea. Send it to me with your name on it or the name you want me to use to credit you. And on the 800th episode of the Venom Vlog, I'm going to, you know, give some of your ideas. I'm going to read some of them out on the show um, and, sh you know, so that you guys are involved with this uh, for that episode. And because it's us celebrating 35 years of Venom this year. So, I'm, you know, that's and 800 episodes of the show. So that's what I want to do. And I'm going to share some of my ideas for alternate universe Venoms. And I'm going to try to draw something. So if you want to just draw a picture and then just write like a one paragraph thing with the drawing, or if you want to just write a two paragraph thing explaining your your version of Venom, what you would like to do. That's totally cool, and I'll share it on the show so everyone can hear your idea as well. So, uh, yeah, if you want to be involved with that, just send the email there before May 5th. That's going to be when I cut it off uh, because I'm going to need to need time to record that episode and get it ready, you know, and edit and everything. So May 5th, that's the deadline. So if you want to be a part of that, please do. I would love to see some of your artwork or some of your story ideas, whatever it is, and we'll share them with the rest of the parasites. All right, that's it for me. I talked long enough. Thanks so much for watching the show. Like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and I'll see you in the future. Peace.